for the reading of God's word coming to us this morning from the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, we come. We come now asking you to minister to us through your word. Open our ears that we would hear. Open our eyes that we would see, Lord, and open our hearts that we would receive what you would pour out by your spirit within us. That we might become children of God through your son, Lord Jesus. Help us to not only better understand, Lord, today through your word what that means, but let us receive and live in that identity, live in that calling, live that life in the resurrection life of Christ, as sons and daughters of God, by faith, in your love. May the meditation of our hearts now and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, our good good Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. It is a beautiful, beautiful third Sunday of Easter, and you heard me right. Easter is more than just one Sunday uh, on the calendar. Easter is a season in the life of of the church, a season where we focus on how the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is meant to redefine the reality of how we live our lives as Christians, how we learn to walk in the way of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit, growing as disciples, learning how to receive, live in, and offer through us the love of God back to God and to one another. Resurrection changes everything, right? That's why we can sing that I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Because of who he is, because of what he has done, we can sing that and mean it. And so today, as we continue in this series, Beyond Easter, the question is, are you a child of God? Do you know what it means to be one? These questions are, are so important, so important. Because right now, contrary to what certain voices in popular culture may claim, no one is innately or naturally born a child of God. 
As we shall see today through the word, the gospel teaches that we can become God's children. God can make us his children when we surrender ourselves to his transforming love offered so freely through Christ. You know, human parents and human children, we are, we are meant to have a similar kind of relationship, this transforming love shared between us. A parent's love is shown through faithful provision, through compassion and steady guidance and tender nurturing. There's discipline involved. There's correction involved. But again, always in love that's meant to grow us, nurture us, help us become who we've been created and called to become. And the healthy response of a child to that kind of healthy love from a parent is, is, is trust, it is security, it is obedience because of that trust, because of the surety of that love of that parent. And when the relationship works that way, both parent and child are absolutely blessed in that love. But then there's the real world, right? Right? How many of us know all too well that when parents and children fail to love each other as they are meant to, that relationship, it will break down. It becomes dysfunctional. It becomes distorted. It, it, it may even be terminated. It may even be cut off completely. So many of us in this room, so many of us online know that pain personally. We know the pain of broken and dysfunctional family relationships. As somebody recently told me, my family put the funk in dysfunction. Too many of us know what that means. And because, because so many of us have struggled so much in our own human families, we struggle to understand what it means to truly believe, truly say that our, our good, good father, our heavenly father loves us. Oh, how he loves us. But it's true. It's true how he does love us. And if we are even to begin to understand what it means to experience life as a child of God, we need to know that from the beginning to end, life as a child of God all depends upon his steadfast love, his life-giving love, his life-changing love. And that's good news to any of us, no matter what our human families have or have not been. Amen? So today, that's what this sermon is all about. It's about life as a child of God. If we're going to learn what it means to experience life in this way, life as a child of God, we need to know what the word teaches us about who a child of God is and how a child of God is meant to live. So that's what we're gonna tackle today, okay? John says, 1 John chapter three, we just read it. Turn there with me if you haven't already or scroll there, whatever works for you. But we're gonna dig deeply into what he has to say. He begins with verse one, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. It all begins with his love. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. Other translations, they, they say, behold, what manner of love, how great a love, how much he loves us. So no matter how you translate it, again, make no mistake, it all begins and all depends upon the love God has for us. That we should be called children of God. But again, how does this happen? How do we become children of God? A little bit of background, a little bit of context here. John is writing this in the late first century, and I know this is gonna be very hard for most of you to believe, but he was, he was writing to Christians who were in conflict with each other. I, I know we can't understand this or relate to this. I know this seems so foreign to us today, but he was writing to a church that was divided, a church that was separating and factionalizing within itself. People didn't all agree on, on how we should follow Jesus. They didn't even all agree on who Jesus really was. And when it came to what does it mean to be a Christian, much less a child of God, there were many different ideas and interpretations and answers, and it was getting ugly. Again, I know we don't have that kind of conflict in the church today, so, so it's hard to understand, but just imagine, just imagine. 
Arguments over who Jesus is. Arguments over what should be expected from those who claim to be his followers. And so John wants to bring clarity to the confusion. He wants to bring encouragement to those who are desperately seeking the truth. And so chapter 3 of his epistle, it begins with this powerful reminder of God's amazing love, which had made them, these believers, who they are as children of God. Notice I said again, made them. For none of us is naturally born a child of God. Again, no matter how many popular voices in our culture may claim that, Christian or not, that's not what the word teaches us. So who is a child of God? That is the question. The Bible teaches us that as human beings, we are all made in the image and likeness of God. Let's make that clear. God has lovingly made us on purpose, with purpose as individuals and also corporately as a species. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, many of you are are very familiar, of course, with this passage. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. From the very beginning, Genesis teaches us that that we are created to partner with and represent our creator in overseeing and caring for his creation. We were formed from the earth to tend and keep the earth to care for it, to nurture it. I know this is hard to understand for our culture today because so many of us are so removed from the rhythms of the earth every day. We live in 70 degrees year round. Some of us have a screen in front of our faces all the time and never step foot outside unless it's to go to the car, then to walk from the car to the store, then to walk from the car back into the house, and that's it. But we were made as human beings to be caretakers, stewards of God's creation, to live in in loving, intimate, and even creative relationship with our creator in this vast, beautiful planet he has created. As God's image bearers, we were made to, to not just receive his love, but also to be ambassadors of it, to be representatives of him in our care for creation and especially in our care for one another. What a calling. What a purpose. That's why we're here. That's why humanity was created in the first place. But then you know the story. You know how it goes. Because of sin, the image of God in us becomes distorted. It becomes twisted. It becomes marred. And it bears far less resemblance to our maker than it was intended. Sin is what what makes us incapable of of rightly caring not only for God's creation, but, but all the more so, far less capable of caring for each other or even ourselves. At least not in the way God has intended but let's pause for a moment. What, what is sin? We, we define it in so many ways, and, and oftentimes we talk about it's, it's missing the mark, like there's a target you're shooting at and you missed it, so we missed the mark of how we're supposed to live. Sometimes we define it as breaking God's law or, or rebellion uh, against God. But I love this way. Uh, that's all true, but there's another way that Eugene Peterson, pastor and author, defined it, and I think this is so true and will be more applicable as we walk through this message today. Peterson writes, he says that sin is a refused relationship with God that spills over into a wrong relationship with others. That is so good. And when you think about your own life, right now you're thinking about the problem you have with her or the problem you have with them. And what Peterson is saying, stop for a moment and go a step deeper and ask, What is the problem I have with God first? How is my relationship with God broken? That's where it begins, that's where it ends. When David sinned with Bathsheba, Psalm 51, he says, against you, O God, against you alone have I sinned. He wasn't denying what he did was wrong to Bathsheba, certainly to Uriah, her husband. He wasn't denying that. What he's saying is at the heart of this is brokenness in my relationship with you, oh God. 
We will never understand sin for what it truly is and truly does unless we see it that way. Because sin is, is failing or refusing to rightly love God and interact with God and receive God's love even that spills over into our inability to love others and even ourselves the way we are meant to. So what was God to do? Well, here's it, the gospel according to John, not first John, we're gonna flip a few pages ahead in the New Testament. The gospel according to John tells us, John chapter one, the true light, he says, this is Christ, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. And here it is. Listen now. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. We talked about that last week. What does it mean to have life in his name? To trust who he is. His name represents the totality of, of who he is and what he has done. It's his nature. It's his character. It's the truth of who God is revealed in Christ. To believe in his name is to entrust your life and everything in it to him. To those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This isn't about natural birth. This isn't about your pedigree or your genealogy. This isn't about your human family. This is what it means to be born again by the Spirit of God into the family of God because of what God has done through Christ. Genesis 1 teaches us that every human being is made in the image and likeness of God, and that is wonderful, and that is beautiful, and that is powerful. No matter who, who you look at today, as you are walking through the store, as you are walking down the street, you will never look in the face of another human being that is not made in the image and likeness of our Creator. That means they are worthy of your respect. They are worthy of, of love, regardless of whether they respect or love you back. Jesus demonstrates this in how he lives his life, how he teaches us to love one another. But John 1 says it gets even better. We're not only made to bear the image and likeness of our creator, God has come to us in Christ to save us from sin and the destruction that it causes. If we will, as John says, receive him for who Christ is, surrender our lives to him in repentance and faith, that means I, I've gotta say, Lord, I don't wanna do it my way anymore. I want to follow your way. Lead me in the path that leads to life, and I'm going to trust you in it. When we do that, God gives us new birth by the Spirit to become children of God. That is what true conversion looks like. And what we're seeing in America today is God is pulling the rug back, he's pulling the curtain back to show who in the church is converted and who is not. Because you can sit in the pew and you can sing the songs and you can go serve every second Tuesday at, 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 at the local shelter. You can do all those things but never have become a child of God because you have related to God in this way. Cultural Christianity, cultural Christianity cannot last, and thank God it is dying. Because people can recognize the real deal. I'm talking about people outside the church. Because God loves us, he's allowing this to happen. Because God loves us, he's allowing this to happen, and he is saying, do you know me in this way? Are you a child of God. It's his desire that you would become one. But it has to happen on his terms. I'm not a child of God because I say so. I'm not a child of God because I've come to God and dictated out what I want my life to look like and who I want him to be and who I want to be. And if you'll sign that on the dotted line, God, then I'm, I'm good to go. That's not how it works. It's on his terms for who he is. We're meant to be saved in Christ and transformed by the Spirit because why? So we can learn how to become not just image bearers of God, but even more specifically, how to become image bearers of Christ in this world. Do you know that? If you are a Christian, you are called to be growing in Christ likeness. I'm not talking about perfectionism. I'm not talking about let's stand around and see who's more, more holy today. That's not what this is. 
It's about surrendering everything that I am, giving up everything. Remember, I'm, apart from God, you and I, we're spiritually dead anyway. He is the one who raises us to walk in newness of life. You are not called any longer to be a slave to sin and fear. You are called to become a child of God. So what does that mean? How do we learn to walk in the way of Jesus? Well, stop and think about this. When you were a child, who did you most want to be like? When you were a kid, who did you hope you would be like one day? Now, do you think of Jesus that way today? Do you look at him and say, Lord, make me like you? Make me like you. Do you pray that way? When I was a boy, I wanted to be just like my dad. As children, we become like the one we behold, for better or for worse. But my father, when I was a boy, I wanted to be just like him. He, he farmed when I was a kid, and, and so he was the one. I wanted to drive the tractors and the big trucks and know how to fix them the way that he did. I wanted to know how to handle cattle and hogs and horses like he could and know that all that he did about them. I wanted to be able to hunt like he could hunt and fish like he could fish. I wanted to be somebody that was recognized by our neighbors as if they need help, Craig Anderson is the one they can call. I wanted to be somebody, a man that was dependable, a man who could be trusted. I wanted to be somebody when my dad would come home and he was dog tired and he was still, he was still come out and shoot baskets with me on that beat up basketball hoop we had stuck on top of the garage. I wanted to be like him. I loved the way my dad lived his life and I wanted to live my life the way he lived his. And I'm thankful that God worked through my father to help me grow. And so that now today I can say that I'm a man who has been born again in Christ. And so now, now every day I say, Lord, I look at the life of Jesus and I want the life of Jesus. I want my life to look more like his. I want to learn how to walk in his way. And I know there's so much that has to be unlearned in my life. There's so much that has to be undone in me that, that, that sin has, has warped and twisted and distorted. I know there's so much distance to go and yet he is the one who says, come, come, follow me. What about you? Do you want to be a child of God in that way? Have you been reborn by the Spirit to become like the one you now behold? Do you want God to work in you, transforming you in his love, so that, as the Bible teaches, we can grow up in our salvation, we can grow up in the likeness of Christ as a child of God, as we learn, as, as, as 1 John says, 1 John 2, that we can walk as he walked. The term Christian, it means, it means little Christ. Did you know that? It's meant to identify somebody as, as one who walks in his way. Imperfectly, yes. So let's continue quickly. How is a child of God supposed to live? How is a child of God meant to live? Here's the, here's the truth, and you all know this. Not everyone wants to be a child of God. At least not on his terms. Rather than learn what it means to be made in God's image, many of us continue to try and fashion God in our own image. That's super popular today in our culture. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I can't get on board with what God said or did here, 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 and here, so I'm gonna just cut that out and remake God in my own image and just create, we never say this, but it's the truth, an idol that reflects me. We are meant to be image bearers of God that reflect him remade, reborn in Christ to reflect even more specifically who Jesus Christ is. How he loves, how he forgives, how he obeys the Father. First John 3, again, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. 
Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Let's unpack that right there. So if you are a child of God, who you are now is a member of God's family. Who you are becoming is meant to be more and more a reflection of Christ in the world. The old saying goes, God loves us as we are, yes, but he loves us too much to leave us there. We are meant to be growing in Christ, changing, being transformed by the life of God at work in us. Again, I'm not talking about works righteousness. I'm not talking about pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and and, and make this happen. This comes through an intimate relationship with God, surrendered to him, walking with him, trusting him, listening as he leads us, as he guides us, as he works on all the mess that we all have within us that keeps spilling out over everybody. We don't do this to earn God's love. You can't make him love you any more than he already does. We don't do this to earn our salvation. Good grief, Christ has already done that. Christ has done that for us, secured it as God's gift. That's what his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension is all about. We can never earn that. It is his gift given to us. No, Christ has come, he says, so that we may have life and life abundant. And life abundant requires that some things are gonna need to change for us and some things are gonna need to change in us. That's what repentance is all about. So God is at work in us. If you're a child of God, God is at work in you. In this lifelong process, we we used to call it sanctification. We are God's children now, but God is not finished with us yet. And thank God, because when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's got a lot of work to do on you before that happens. (laughs) Hopefully they're saying it right back to you. That goes for all of us. But this is God's promise, and this is our hope. John goes on, again, 1 John 3, verse 3, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So how how in the world can we purify ourselves? What does that mean? Well, turn to 1 Peter, or you don't have time to do that. We gotta get to communion here, and I wanna make sure we have plenty of time. 1 Peter, I'm gonna have it on the screen. 1 Peter 1, verses 22 through 23. Peter, speaking on this very same topic, he says, having purified your souls, how? By your obedience to the truth. Leading to, he goes on, for a sincere brotherly love. He's talking about how can we actually, not just talk about it, but actually do it. How can we love each other as God has commanded us? Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again. Not of perishable seed. These bodies are going to die. We need the the, the life of Christ, the spirit of God alive in us. We've been born again of imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. One commentator said righteousness is, is not a condition for rebirth. It's a consequence of it. If we've been born again by the living and abiding word of God, obedience to the truth, which is obedience to Christ and his word, that should be our desire. Why? Because we love Christ. What did Jesus say? He said, if you love me, obey my commandments. I'm gonna just get real and raw with you for a second. If obeying Christ seems so hard, and it's such a, such a drudge, drudgery to you, if, if, if it's so difficult, I, I, I'm not here to condemn you, I am here to, to, to ask you, seek God. And no matter what you've thought about your relationship with God up to this point, ask yourself, am I a child of God in this way? Do I love him who has first loved me? That's the question. That's the question. Jesus asks us that, do you you love me? It's right and good for us to remind ourselves how much he loves us, but we also have to be asking ourselves, "Do, do I love him? Do I love him? A child of God seeks to obey Christ, why? Because we love him. 
Do we do this perfectly? No, we don't. Like children, we, we need practice. We need to learn from our mistakes. We need to be corrected and disciplined in love. And that's what God promises to provide as we learn, again, to walk in the way of Christ. We are like children holding on to the hand of our Father. We're gonna trip, we're gonna stumble, we're gonna fall down, but we keep walking by the power of the Spirit, resurrection life that has raised us to walk in newness of life with him. That's the journey. And so when people come to church and they get frustrated and they get angry because, oh my goodness, there's conflict in the church and all these people, they've got as many problems as I have. I gotta go find another church. No, thank God you found a church where people are like, I'm, just, I, I'm gonna start being real. I'm gonna quit wearing my church face and pretending like it's all okay when it ain't all okay. Our culture, our culture has conditioned us that we should never be in community that doesn't just meet all the expectations that we have by ourselves. I don't have to be with anybody I don't wanna be with. I don't have to be with anybody I don't like. I don't have to be with anybody who doesn't agree with me. I don't have to be with anybody who doesn't constantly just affirm and endorse everything I think and say and do. If that's what you're looking for, you ain't never gonna find a church that God is alive in and working in because God is alive and at work in his church because he is working on us as children of God. We're gonna actually meet God in deeper ways when we get into the heart of what does it really mean to work through conflict together? What does it mean to say we love each other enough out of the overflow of our love for God that we're gonna seek truth together and love and encourage each other, working through our problems. I'm not saying ignore conflict. I'm not saying ignore wrongdoing or, or offense. No, we have to work through this. How do we make it right? How do we seek forgiveness? How do we offer forgiveness? All these things. Because what does John say? Going on, verse four. Talking about everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices Practices, lawlessness, it's easy for me to say. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is broken relationship. And so many of us, we just float from place to place, from setting to setting, even from church to church, with brokenness in relationships. And we never, ever seek God to say, how could you actually possibly be at work to try to bring healing in this, whereby I will be changed from one degree of glory to another, more into the likeness of Christ? We don't ask those questions. So we persist in sin, practicing sin as lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. We sing that, say that all the time. And in him, in Christ, there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. So if you're part of a healthy church and you keep on sinning, if somebody there loves you, hopefully they're coming around you, not to condemn you, but to say, hey, there's life and life abundant, but this does not bring that. Not in a self-righteous, judgmental way, but in a genuine way where you actually want to walk with each other, caring for each other. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. So here, what, what, is, what is John saying? Are we going to make mistakes? Are we going to fall short of the glory of God? Are we going to, to sin? That's going to happen in our lives, but there's a difference between falling into that or making a mistake because your emotions got the better of you or, or you were just you know, hangry that day or whatever the case may be. That's different than willfully saying, I'm gonna follow in, in this, the devil in disobedience and rebellion against God. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness, whoever does not practice right relationship that comes first from God in our relationship with God and then overflows into where we are connected to others, that's what righteousness is. It is right relationship. It is being rightly related to each other. Unrighteous means that relationship is broken or twisted or perverted. Think of all the ways in which we as human beings wrongly relate to each other. You can't say you're of God if you do not love your brother, John says. 
We are purified by practice. We are purified by practicing our obedience to Christ, empowered by the Spirit, if we are born again as children of God. And so here's what we gotta do. Are you a child of God? Children of God learn to practice righteousness, forsaking the willful practice of sin and learning to more fully love God and each other through our obedience to Christ. So here's something I want us to do. We're gonna go to the table. And so right now, I'm gonna invite our our servers to come forward. I'm gonna invite our our prayer team to come forward. And the reason we're, we're sharing around the table after the message today is because the table is all about right relationship. The table is all about righteousness that God offers us, that God has made possible for us with him first and with each other second. The table is about forgiveness of sin, yes, but why why does our sin need to be forgiven? So that we may be, as the Bible says, reconciled to God through Christ. Reconciled for what? Relationship, intimacy. That picture in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 of the intimacy of us with our Father in the garden, do you know that that is exactly what God has created us for and intends for us now through Christ as we are reborn by the Spirit as children of God? And so as we are coming forward, I want us, there's a prayer Eugene Peterson wrote specifically for the church to help us navigate this. And so I'm gonna ask you, right where you are, if you can see it on the screen, I want you to pray this with me. And we're going to use this as an invitation to center our hearts and minds for the table. But this idea of what it means to be children of God, what it means to recognize him for who he is, receive him, and all that that means, would you pray this with me? Dear Lord Jesus, help me to love the group of people that you have designated as your church, your body. Help me see them as my family. Grant me the grace to accept all the members of that family, not simply tolerate them, but treat them tenderly with all the love and affection that I would want to be treated with. Help me to realize that just as there are no perfect families, there are no perfect churches. They are all, as I am, a work in progress. As you are patient with me, the work that is progressing in me, grant that I would be patient with the work that is progressing in them. 